Okay, wonderful. So, um, as many of you probably already know, the suicide rates among the Arctic states are, are predominantly much higher than those in non-Arctic states. Um, and if you also look at specifically at areas that have high levels of indigenous, uh, high populations of indigenous communities, um, you'll see that those are really high as well. So the ones here um, are on the left-hand side of the graph outline areas in uh, Russia, the Shukutka area, uh, Arkhangelsk, uh, Greenland. Um, and as a point of reference, the red arrows show you where the United States fits in as well as Alaska. Um, don't want to dwell too much. You have these, these slides um, you know, are available through the website. Uh, and the references are there, but the, the point of this slide is just to, to acknowledge and, and, and recognize that suicide in the Arctic is a major public health crisis. In response to that, through the U.S. Chairmanship of the Arctic Council the past two years, we uh, at NIMH, along with other federal partners and international organizations, uh, led an initiative to reduce the incidence of suicide in indigenous groups, uh, Stranger Night through networks. It was under the auspices of the Sustainable Development Working Group of the Arctic Council, some of which may be familiar. Um, and this is just a screenshot of our landing page for Rising Sun. The, the HR link is at the top. Um, it gives you more background on the context, the backgrounds, the additional sponsors, uh, bios of scientific advisory group and brief summaries and links to meeting reports of several of the workshops that we held under this initiative. Uh, just to sort of thank those those partners that were involved in the initiative, uh, we had, as I mentioned, federal, several other federal agencies, including SAMHSA, CDC, uh, Department of State, certainly as our main liaison with the Arctic Council, being sort of our foreign ministry. We also had the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the National Institute of Public Health from Denmark, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and this being an Arctic Council initiative, also uh, important support from one of the permanent participant groups, in this case, the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Um, this slide is basically a schematic of the different activities and the, the, the progress to date now, June 2017, of the different um, sort of approaches that we took. There were three workshops held in September of 15, last spring, and then earlier this, this March. Um, and, I'll, and I'll briefly say a little bit about those in the subsequent slide. We also conducted a consensus building exercise known as the Delphi Method. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that as well in subsequent slides. Uh, and to supplement both these in-person regional meetings as well as the Delphi process, uh, there was an opportunity to hold sort of focus group discussions, uh, listening sessions, and both in Canada and the United States over the past year uh, to reach those rural communities um, that weren't able to attend any of the workshops or were not directly involved in the Delphi process. Um, that Delphi process involved, sort of just to back up a little bit, involved identifying a scientific advisory group. Uh, ours were uh, a subset of clinicians and researchers and policy folks from the different sponsoring organizations and from five of the six permanent participant groups or um, indigenous peoples organizations of the Arctic Council. We had uh, several native youth uh, leaders as well on, on, on the board. And following that scientific advisory group's recommendation, we nominated several hundred individuals to participate in the Delphi process. Uh, and again, this spanned a wide range of stakeholders across the circumpolar Arctic, uh, all the Arctic states, and uh, five of the six permanent participant organizations uh, from clinicians, community members, policy folks, researchers, um, and other stakeholders, including survivors and advocates for suicide prevention. Um, at this stage, we technically we are done because uh, the Rising Sun project was part of the US chairmanship, with, which ended um, last month at a ministerial meeting in Fairbanks. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that our, our, our work is done um, and activities report is available on the Sustainable Development Working Site. Now we're in the process of disseminating information about the project, um, as well as uh, trying to find ways to implement um, the initiative, which um, some of you who were not familiar with Rising Sun was really about developing outcomes and measures to help evaluate suicide prevention interventions. So um, just quickly, sort of to recap some of the workshops that we held. Um, over the past year and a half, uh, we actually launched a meeting in Anchorage uh, back in fall of 2015. Uh, the picture in the top left sort of recognizes some of the scientific advisory group members. Uh, some of you may recognize uh, Denise Dillard 
third from the right, who's a director of research at South Central Foundation there in Anchorage. And on the far right is Pamela Collins, my office director, um, who was sort of really one of the, the driving forces behind, behind the Rising Sun Initiative. Um, and that launch basically was to announce what the work was going to be, be, be doing, as well as get uh, initial feedback from uh, a lot of Alaska Native community members were, were in attendance. Uh, there were some concerns raised about the methodologies. We tried to address as best as we could uh, with these supplementary discussion focus group sessions, um, and that got us underway. The second meeting, uh, represented by the photo of our co-chair, our handsome co-chair Tom Hennessy on the lower left-hand side, as well as with, uh, with Cody Chip, uh, some of you may know from the Aleutian People Off Islands Association. Um, in Tromsø, Norway, we met last May uh, to sort of give a progress report on Rising Sun, but also focus uh, on some work that was being done by the Sami Council um, in their efforts to, to develop and release a suicide prevention plan specific to the Sami uh, in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. And that was actually released a few months ago and is available. I think I may have put a notice on, on the IRP Collaboration's website. If not, then I'll, I'll, I'll reissue that so that folks can see a sort of cultural, culturally or, or community-specific suicide prevention plan that takes into account uh, traditional ways of knowing as well as sort of that cultural competency that seems to be lacking a lot of uh, service providers providers who, who work in rural and with tribal communities. Um, our last meeting, um, sort of demonstrated by the picture on the right-hand side, was in Iqaluit, Canada. Uh, it was very cold. It was about minus 60 degrees in March, but uh, we toughed it out. It was a wonderful meeting to really sort of consolidate the work that had been done over the previous 18 months or so for Rising Sun and other related uh, activities, including um, last year, late last year, the Inuit um, uh, there was a national Inuit suicide prevention strategy released in part through uh, one of the Canadian Inuit organizations, ITK. Um, I can't remember the acronym, but it's Inuit Ta Tapirit Kanatami, uh, as well as with the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Um, they had worked long and hard um, to develop specific strategies for Inuit suicide prevention in their communities, largely in the Nunavut area. So this was our sort of... Um, I say uh, our, our celebration, if you will, uh, identifying the, the types of outcomes that were that emerged from the Rising Sun process, as well as identify and acknowledge the great work that is being done in other parts of the circumpolar Arctic with respect to suicide prevention and 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 and, and uh, mental health. And um, one of our, our other speaker, Angela Mark, was also there. Uh, she might be able to have some comments as well on that. Um, the main thrust outside of those workshops was the Delphi process, um, which again aimed at developing consensus um, around uh, different types of, of outcomes um, that, that should be achieved um, as a result of suicide prevention interventions. Um, these were iterative rounds in which we kept the same group of panelists uh, basically on call to respond to, to, to questions around this issue. Uh, this is a way to build consensus and to set priorities. Um, over the three rounds, essentially, we, we, we came about um, by asking an open-ended question initially of identifying the types of outcomes. Um, you know, in addition to reducing suicide, of course, in terms of what should, should be achieved across the communities, the first round yielded over 600 individual um, outcomes, uh, some of which were duplicates and could be consolidated. Uh, during our second meeting in Trump, so we sort of winnowed that down. We had over 130, 140 outcomes which were discussed and, and further sort of uh, consolidated. Um, in the second round of, of our process, we asked all the panelists to pick up their pick their top five. So it was basically a frequency distribution. Of the top. Everybody had 25 votes and voted across the 130. Well, it, it was about 100 in, uh, for that second round that were unique outcomes. And after we had we had um, gotten our 25, the third and final round was about prioritization in terms of looking at um, what is the, the relevance um, of these outcomes to specific communities, what is the feasibility of actually achieving those, and then the, the impacts. And you know, these are sort of just a, a snapshot because impacts could be short-term versus long-term, um, and also the the, the level of intervention can vary for some of these outcomes. Um, in general, for example, uh, the outcomes could be 
or the interventions that lead to these outcomes could be implemented at different scales. For example, uh, at a very broad policy level, all the way down to individual interventions. Um, interestingly enough, looking across the, the, the diverse group of panelists that served on the Delphi uh, exercise, which included, again, clinicians and researchers and policy folks and um, elders and, and native youth, uh, as well as across the circumpolar Arctic, although there was a, a bit of a bias uh, towards North America, Canada and US was about 40%, 40, 40, percent of all the, all the, all the participants, uh, we did have a good, good uh, input from Scandinavia, a, a fair amount, a handful of individuals from Russia, um, as well as from, from Greenland, um, that also contributed. So, you know, it just wasn't sort of a, a single perspective. And across the different panels, we did see uh, probably a, you know, a wide range of outcomes that um, focused largely on family and community-based interventions that really emphasized traditional knowledge and, and ways of healing, um, as well as um, intergenerational relationships and, and tying back to culture and land in many ways. Um, I'm not going to list the outcomes here. We actually have a technical paper that is that is being reviewed, um, but. Some of you are, are, could be familiar with some specific apps, and, and those will be widely released um, in the coming months. Um, in addition to the technical paper, we are working on a, um, uh, a, a toolkit, which will, I'll say a little bit more in one or two slides. Before I get to that, however, um, one of the things that has been a challenge um, through this whole process is trying to identify different measures uh, that go along with the outcomes related to, 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 to well-being in, in youth and in communities. Um, in particular, uh, you know, I, I can give you an example of some of the types of outcomes um, that, that were, were um, prioritized things. Uh, recognizing and breaking taboos, increasing community connectedness, developing a skilled, confident, and caring workforce, accessible and adequate follow-up to behavioral support, raising political awareness and initiatives to prevent suicide and increase cult cultural identification. That's just a snapshot. But in terms of actually trying to, to assess or evaluate when we achieve those outcomes, um, there, there need to be some, some sort of metrics. Um, there are existing metrics out there for a range of outcomes related to physical, emotional, sexual abuse, for example, physical and um, emotional neglect. There are a few tools out there um, you know, from the, I've taken some of these examples, this schematic is from uh, sort of a consolidated image from uh, different sources, including trauma exposure measures. Uh, there's a, a evidence-based clearinghouse for child welfare, Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, uh, Suicide Prevention Resource Centers. Um, and it's important to, again, try to make sure that um, any type of measures that are developed specific, that are specific to the Arctic context and, and different rural communities, whether it's in Alaska or Greenland or Russia or parts of Scandinavia, that they are actually uh, vetted and evaluated in a good way. So there are, there are you know, uh, measures for adverse childhood experiences, ACE, ACE, ACEs, um, and those work really well, for example, in, in, you know, in the lower 48 and in non-tribal communities. Um, and it's, I think, our task, our challenge to see whether or not you know, ACEs types of measures as well as these others that are out there um, are, are equally valid. And if not, can we develop some new ones uh, in the future? Um, so NIMH is, you know, really driven around resource, uh, supporting research, either conducting it through the intramural program or funding outside research. Um, and Andrea will, will tell you a little bit more about that during her presentation. But, um, you know, there's, there's still quite a bit of work to go ahead around these measures. So just to recap, you know, we have you know, quite a bit to go through uh, with the other speakers. I would say that uh, with the rising sun, um, despite you know, sort of finishing the main activities for say the data collection and analysis components, um, the two remaining items include this technical report, which is undergoing review uh, through the scientific advisory group. Uh, it will be put up for publication in the coming months. Um, and of course, the web-based toolkit, which I mentioned towards the beginning of my presentation, which uh, will be a uh, online website uh, resources that include sort of a nice introduction to suicide prevention efforts across the Arctic, some case studies or best practices of, of, of um, programs and activities that have been successfully implemented, 
in this, this sphere. Um, and again, just the full on prioritize outcomes with measures and perhaps most importantly, some strategies for actually using the toolkit. Because again, we have different stakeholders. We have clinicians and we have researchers and we have policymakers. And so the key is to be able to utilize the toolkit with its outcomes and measures to help inform decisions and appropriate interventions in those communities. And ideally, uh, we hope that this cool this toolkit will be able to use, you know, will be used to um, well, we, the phrasing we use is to harmonize evaluation of interventions across communities. Uh, we will also hopefully allow this toolkit to allow communities to measure what is relevant to their needs. Um, and importantly, from a research context, um, is to share and compare data across different studies of effectiveness. Um, I'll just mention one more thing and conclude here with the you know things going forward. Even though Rising Sun is no more, as you know, as, as a as a which is sort of a chairmanship activity. Um, I'm working with the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and uh, several other folks in the state of Alaska and tribal organizations and a few other federal agencies, including Angela Mark and SAMHSA, working um, with an Arctic mental health working group that has been stood up by the commission. Um, you can read there's some major goals. It's basically, basically the goals are to strengthen systems, uh, you know, to prevent suicide. Uh, there's a website named here at the bottom. There's a fact sheet that they have there. Um, I'll leave you those interested folks to to pursue that and uh, navigate their site for a little bit more information. Um, and then finally, just my contact. So um, I'm happy to entertain some questions, some burning questions now, um, if folks have them. Otherwise, we can move on to our next presentation. Thank you very much. Anybody else? <laughs> Can folks still hear me? Yes? I can't hear anybody. We hear you, Roberto. Okay, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Just let me make sure people are out there. I hear you can. I'm moving my hand, but you can't see me. No, sorry. Okay. Um, Roberto, this is Tom Hennessy. I just uh, want to uh, suggest maybe a next place to share information on Rising Sun. I don't know if you're aware of the Alaska Native Health Research Conference that's happening October 16th through 18th in Anchorage. It's the fifth one of these, and this would be a good place to, to feature Rising Sun at, uh, to a variety of health researchers and community mm -hmm. stakeholders. Thank you, Tom. Tim Thomas has already reached out to me, inviting me to, to participate and facilitate a panel on suicide prevention, which uh -huh. will include some of the PIs that NIMH will be funding. We're uh, a collaborative research hubs that Andrea will talk about uh, later in the meeting. So thank you. But, but yes, uh, that's, that's, we're definitely looking forward to contributing, participating in that, in that conference later this year. Great. Thank you. 